Hello guys, welcome to this new video. So this is going to be question 1 in the May 2023, time zone 2, paper 2. So here we are provided with a toy rocket made of a plastic bottle and has some water in it. We pump some air into it and then when the pressure is going to be large enough, large enough the bottle will be launched up into the sky and we are given the variation of the vertical velocity as a function of the time and then they say that the bottle reaches its highest point at time t1 and it returns to the ground at time t2 and then the the bottle bottle is bouncing when it hits the ground and the motion of the bottle after the bounce is showed on this dashed line over here all right so in part A, we have to calculate the maximum height reached by the bottle. So here in the question, they also say that the bottle reaches the highest point at time T1. So the maximum height reached will be at time T1. This can also be seen from the fact that simply here, the vertical velocity is zero. And when the rocket is flying up, when it reaches the top here, the velocity for a second will be uh, zero and so that's why there's a x-intercept there and we need to see the distance or the yeah the, the maximum height during this part of the motion so here we have a velocity time graph and usually whenever we're provided with a graph at some point during the question we're going to need to calculate the slope or the area of some parts of the graph and here we need to do that already because if we have a velocity time graph then the area under the graph will be the distance covered. So if we have some graph like this, then the area here will be distance. Which I think is the easiest to see if we consider the units of the axes, as velocity is just meters per second, time is uh, just seconds, and when we find the area, we multiply this side with this side, so the x and the y. So if we multiply the, the numbers, we must also multiply the units. And when we find the area, then we do meters per second times seconds, as we do velocity times time, which will be just meters. So we have units of displacement, which is a good sign. So to the question now, we need to find this area over here. And well, there are two ways to do this. One of the ways is a little bit more tedious which is to calculate each square that is present underneath this uh, curve. Or you can uh, draw this triangle over here and approximate the area in this way. Since we only need to estimate, both methods are accepted. So you can do which whenever you want. But if you would want to count the squares, maybe this is more common in the IB exam question. So that's why I'll show you this one. So you would just need to consider the distance covered for one square. So like if you consider one tiny square, that has a uh, time of, of uh, 0 0.1 seconds and it has a velocity of 1 meters per second. So the area of this will be 0 0.1 meters. So for every square that we count, it has covered 0 0.1 meters in the air. So if you would go ahead and count it, you would see that there are 60 full squares in under the curve over there. And since we know one square is 0 0.1 meters, then the total distance covered is a... Uh, Oh, well, no, sorry, there are 60 full squares, but then we also need to count these uh, partial squares that are here that are not fully underneath, only like partially. So like, for example, if we count these two as one full square, then we will have 12 more uh, full squares approximately. Like this. And so we will have in total 72 squares and we need to multiply this by 0 0.1 meter for each. So we end up with the result of 7.2 meters. But as I said, you could also split it up into two triangles. Both are 90 degrees. We know the height 
of the triangle we can also see the base and then we just find the area of these two sub triangles and then we add up these areas maybe that's a little bit quicker but usually in these estimate questions the mark scheme also provides a range of values so these different methods are usually always taken into account all right and then we need to estimate again we need to estimate the acceleration of the bottle when it's at its maximum height so again we need to consider a time t1 and well again we need to look at the graph and in a velocity time graph the slope will give us acceleration acceleration because velocity over time which is the slope y over x so the y units over the x units v over t will be acceleration or if you have learned derivatives in maths then you also learn that the derivative of a velocity time function will be the acceleration time function so the slope at any point of a velocity time graph will give us the acceleration and we need to find the slope at the highest point so again t equals one so what we need to do is draw a slope over here and find the well, i mean draw a gradient at t equals one and find the slope of this so we would need to select two points that are sufficiently far apart it can really be anything you like and then just find the slope since we know that the slope is the change in y over the change in x so you would take two points look at the change in the y coordinates over the change in the x coordinates then an example for this would be uh, 20 over 2.45 but again pretty much any values would work here it's just that the answer needs to be somewhere around 9.7 meters per second squared but again here there's a range of values accepted so ib is quite lenient here but you do need to be reasonably accurate and you can see also as a side note here that this is approximately 9.81 since we're just launching it vertically only gravity is acting on it so its acceleration is expected to be somewhere around um, gravity gravity's constant value yes and then in part c we are told that the bottle bounces when it returns to the ground that was this dash part over here as they said at the start of the question and we need to calculate the fraction of the kinetic energy of the bottle that remains after the bounce so yeah the fraction that remains after the bounce so we need to see how much kinetic energy we had before and how much we had after the bounce so these will be the two points we need to consider this is before bounce and here it's after the bounce you can also see that before the bounce the velocity was negative which makes sense because the rocket was falling back down and it had a negative velocity because it's flow, uh, it was falling down. So that's what we consider negative here. And then after a bounce, it's obviously going to be flying up again. So it's going to have a positive velocity. And that's why we have these negative and positive velocities here. So the before the bounce, it had a speed of, uh, let's say, minus 10 meters per second. And after the bounce, it had a speed of, let's say, 4.5 meters per second. Obviously, you don't want to put the dot so that you don't see the value itself. But you see that's approximately 4.5. So then we need to see how the ratio of these two compare. So we would need to do the, well, the ratio would just be E kinetic final divided by e kinetic initial and so this will be one half m v final squared over one half m v initial squared and you see that one half m is present on both sides so we can cancel that out and so the ratio will just be v final over v initial squared which will be 4.5 over 10 squared which will give us approximately 
uh, 20%. So 20% remains. Like this. Or a fifth or any of these versions would work as an answer. So now we are also told the mass of the bottle and how much time it was in contact with the ground for. 85 milliseconds. And we need to calculate the average force exerted by the ground on the bottle. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. All right. So first of all, we are provided with two sig figs. Here and here. So our final answer will need to be two significant figures. And likely one mark out of these three will be given for the correct number of significant figures, especially when the question explicitly asks us to do this. So we know the speed before and after the bounce, and we also know the mass. So if we think about Newton's second law, the most common equation people remember is m times a, but another very important formula, which is also in the data booklet, is that the net force is the change in momentum over the change in time. And so we can calculate the net force through this formula as we know the mass, we know the change in momentum since we know the change in speed, and we know the time it was in contact for. So this we can all just plug in as the change in momentum will just be the mass times the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And so the mass is 27 times 10 to the minus 3. And then the change in velocity will just be v final minus v initial. So here we need to watch out because, well, v final was just 4.5. That's simple. Minus v initial. But velocity is a vector quantity, meaning it has a direction and a magnitude. And here the velocity was minus 10, minus 10. So we need to do minus minus then here. We need to take into account the, the direction of the velocity as well. And uh, well, yeah, this is very important to remember. It comes up in many questions. And I'm sure that during the exam, many people forgot to do this as well. They just did 4.5 minus 10 and they just continued calculating. But whenever we consider a momentum, direction is always very important. So if we plug this in, we find that this is 4.6 newtons. But we are not done yet because we need to calculate the average force exerted by the ground on the bottle. On the bottle. So the force exerted by the ground. And if we think about the bottle like landing on the ground, let's just say that this is the bottle and this is the ground. Then if we draw a free body diagram here, then we will see that we have the weight of the bottle and we will have this upwards force of the ground. Let's call this F up, rev ground, doesn't matter. So this, these are the two forces we have, right? And this F, F up is what we need to calculate. That's what is mentioned here in the question, as that's the force exerted by the ground. But what did we calculate now? Well, now we calculated the net force, right? And the net force is the sum of these two forces. F net is equal to F up minus W. And this is what we calculated, but we need to solve for F up, the upwards force. So what we still need to do is that we need to add the weight force. Because if we rearrange that red equation, we see that the net force, I mean, the upwards force will be the net force plus the weight force. The, the weight of the bottle. So we still need to do 4.6 plus 27 times 10 to the minus 3. That's how many kilograms the bottle is times 9.81. So that will be the weight of the bottle. And that will give us 4.9 newtons to two significant figures. Very important not to forget after this lengthy calculation. It wouldn't be worth losing a mark on this. So yeah, this, this concept also comes up very often that the question doesn't ask for the net force. If the question would have asked for the net force, then we could have stopped at 4.6, but uh, it didn't. So we needed to go a little bit further to calculate the actual pure force exerted by the 
ground on the bottle. And then in this last part of the question, they, we are told that uh, the maximum height reached by the bottle is greater when we have an air-water mixture rather than only high-pressure air in the bottle. So they are pretty much saying that when we have this setup, air plus water, we're going to reach a higher altitude than if we would only have air. And the question wants us to explain why we're going to reach a greater maximum height if the speed at which the propellant leaves is the same. So we need to look back at the equation we just used in the previous question, that the net force is the change in momentum over the change in time. So again, we can see that the change in momentum here will be the change in velocity times the change in mass over the change in time. And if we have water, well, water is heavier than air. So if we fill it with water like halfway, for example, then the mass of the bottle is going to be heavier. And so when it expels all of that water, this delta M over delta T is going to be larger than if it was only with air because we're losing more mass per second. So that is why our change in momentum will be larger uh, when we have water as well. larger with water like this and so since we have a larger change in momentum we will have a larger net force and so if the net force is larger then then logically we will reach a max larger maximum height and uh, yeah compared to a uh, only air mixture. So this was question one in the May 2023 Time Zone 2 paper two. And uh, see you in the next question.